You're listening to the Audacious Church Podcast. This message was recorded live at our Manchester campus. We know this is a great investment into your life. So tune in, listen up and stay focused. For any more information, visit us online, audaciouschurch.com. I am, uh, I'm preaching four times today, everybody. And uh, it's always dangerous preaching when you've got jet lag because anything can happen. It's usually in jet lag moments that we preachers say things we don't mean or end up being viral. So if you're paying attention, you never know what could happen today. I'm, uh, I'm doing the shuffle this morning. I'm going down to our south location in a few moments and then back for the second service here in a few moments. And also tonight, we have our discipleship night. Discipleship night is starting tonight. Now we had a worship night last week, but tonight is discipleship night and we are going to go a lot deeper. We're gonna do deep diving on some really, really important subjects that we are facing as Christians in the day and age that we live in. And I am really excited about it. Now tonight, I'm gonna be sharing with you how to read the Bible. Now, don't mistake this with the online three-part service series that we did during COVID, which was very light. It was very easy. Uh, tonight, we're gonna do a deep dive. You're gonna learn things like, uh, phrases like exegesis, eisegesis, hermeneutics. I'm gonna teach you how to read the Bible. And what you need to do is bring a notepad and a pen or digital version, come ready to take notes, because I'm gonna teach you how to read the Bible And then we're gonna deal with this verse coming up on screen tonight. I don't know if you've read this verse before, but this one is an absolute doozy from 1 Corinthians chapter 14, where Paul is speaking about women. And speaking about women, he says, women should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission, as the law says. How good is that? (laughs) Did you know that is in the Bible? Did you know it's in the Bible? Did you know actually, uh, Bible teaches that men go to heaven half an hour earlier than women. Did you know that? In Revelation 8 verse one, it says there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And that's because men went first and I'm joking. But that verse there, that's in the Bible. So how do we deal with that? Well, what is the Bible? What's the Bible actually teaching us and how do we read that and understand that? So I'm gonna teach you how to read and understand the Bible and then together we're gonna deal with that verse. If you miss out, you miss out. So you gotta be here. Come five o'clock for coffee for a 5.30 start. We're gonna have worship and then we're gonna get into it. I think tonight I've got somewhere in the region of 110 slides for screen. 110 slides. So you know it's gonna, it's gonna be a doozy. And uh, I'm bringing my, my, my Bible study reference Bible, so it's gonna be a serious, it's gonna be a good night. And, um, and uh, yeah, women should stay silent in church. I think we're done for the day, aren't we? I think we can go home. And, uh, but I'm, uh, I feel like a kid in a, candy co- in a candy shop today with the subject that I've got in this deep diving series that we're going on, stronger, deeper Sunday morning series. This is part three. And uh, I'm super, super excited about the subject this morning because I really believe the message this morning is gonna bring absolute, in fact, I, I can give you a God guarantee that the subject this morning will bring breakthrough to your life. It will. God guarantees it if you apply this. Now, if you are like me, I'm always looking for easy tips for things. You know what I mean? You know, three tips to have a body like Idris Elba. You know, that, that, that'd go viral, wouldn't it? You know, um, two tips, how to have uh, good mental health. That, that's, that's a good one. 99 tips, because it's complicated, how to have a healthy marriage. You know, we're all looking for quick fire, successful tips on how to succeed, how to, how to get breakthrough. And this subject this morning is one tip. It's a God guarantee. It's not even my guarantee. It's not even the church's guarantee. It's God's guarantee. God guarantees success in your life 
if you adhere to what He's talking about in this subject this morning. It's all about the power, are you ready for this? Of tithing. That's exactly the uh, response I was expecting. You know, if I was in America and I was preaching this message, they'd be hooping and hollering and people would actually be throwing money. But in England, it's like, ooh, squeaky bums time. Some of you are holding your, your some of you are holding the notes so, so hard that the Queen's face is crying right now on that. The power of tithing, it is a, it is a God guarantee. Now I'm excited about it because for some of you who already do it, you get it. It's like a refresher. And this stronger, deeper Sunday morning series is all about giving the why behind the what. And so we don't wanna do things just out of a religious duty. We wanna know why we do the things that we do. And so this is the why behind the what of tithing. And I'm also excited because some of you don't tithe and this is gonna be revelation to you. And it's the God guarantee. God guarantees it. He says, if you do this, then watch what I will do. Now, all I can say is this, I am a walking testimony and tribute to the power of this guarantee in Scripture. That Glenn, if you tithe, watch what I will do in your life and around your life. So I can give personal testimony to the power of this truth this morning in all of our lives. Now, I also know this, that whenever we talk, have a message on the power of tithing or anything like that, invariably someone will be upset. Now, not you in this service because you're perfect, but definitely in the 12 o'clock service. I'm gonna get emails after that from someone saying, why do you always emphasise money? And I always say, what are you talking about? We emphasise everything we do. We emphasise security. That's why our, our protective service teams are on duty every week, looking after not just you, but also your cars. We emphasise cleanliness. That's why you come into a clean building. Car parks are cleaned every morning and the local roads by our teams. We emphasise kids' ministry, which is why our kids' ministry is so brilliant. We emphasise everything we do. But this one here, friends, is a God-given guarantee. It's not an American gospel. It's not a prosperity gospel. It's Bible. It is a God guarantee. And I want you to know that this guarantee is not like the washing machine we bought a few years ago. That has a guarantee for two years. And if you pay a little bit extra, then you can get a little bit of an extension. No, no, this guarantee is for your whole life. It is a deal that God makes with us. And so I love that. Now, I also want you to know before we get into it, that as your senior pastor, I don't know who tithes. I don't have vision. I don't have visibility over who gives and who doesn't give. I don't know who tithes. However, I probably can guess who tithes by what's taking place in a person's life. Because of what the Bible says of what God does to someone who is a tither. And here's what the Bible says, Malachi chapter three, eight to 12. Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you, Lord? In tithes and offerings. You're under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not open the floodgates or throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there would not be enough room for you to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it's ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations, all the people, all the community, all your colleagues will call you blessed for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Now tonight, in the principles that I'm gonna be giving you on the subject of exegesis, eisegesis, and hermeneutics, you can take tonight's principles and apply it to this passage and do your own deep dive on tithes and offerings. And you can understand from Genesis all the way through to Revelation also, 
why it is such an important thing. But let me give you some thoughts on the tithe. The tithe literally means a tenth or 10%. In fact, recently I was driving through a, a suburb of Manchester, I think it was up by Oldham, and there was up there a tithe barn that goes back hundreds and hundreds of years. And so the concept of the tithe is not a new notion. The tithe has been around all through Scripture, in fact, going all the way back to Cain and Abel, which we'll read about in a moment's time. Let me give you three things about the power of the tithe. And the first thing is this, is that we tithe because in tithing, we are honouring God. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9, it says, Honour the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. So with the first fruit of everything that comes in, the Bible says, honour God. Put Him first. Honour means tribute. It's, it's respect, it's admiration and it's praise. Just eight days ago, on uh, a week yesterday, I was in Melbourne and I was flying back up to Queensland where my mum lives. And I know that one of the, the true global statesmen of the church often holidays where my mum lives. And so I text him on the Saturday. I said, hey, listen, I don't know if you're on holidays but I'm flying home to see my mum later tonight. If you're free tomorrow night, would you like to catch up? He texts me straight back. He said, oh, I'd love to catch up. He said, why don't you come over at 8.30 on Sunday and come and spend some time with me. And so Sunday afternoon, Sophie and I made sure we do what you do too when you go to visit people who you respect. We went to the mall. I went to a shop to make sure I bought something for him that I knew he would love, something that he would enjoy and something that was not cheap because he was worthy of honour. My wife went into a jewellery shop and picked out some items for the husband, the man's wife. And when I went to see them at 8.30 and we spent six hours together, the first thing I did was I gave him gifts. And I did it as a way of saying, I honour you. I honour your history. I honour your now. I honour your future. I hold you in high admiration. You're an encourager. You're a blesser. And so I am encouraging and blessing you. We do that all the time with friends and colleagues. And the Bible puts it this way. It says, Matthew 6, 21, where your treasure is, there your heart is also. It's the sense where when you honour someone with your treasure, your heart leans into relationship. Now, I hadn't seen the particular gentleman for maybe two or three years, certainly since pre-pandemic, but I do know this, the simple nature of honouring with a gift caused their hearts to open once again. And we had some fascinating conversation where not only were they blessed, but I was blessed. In fact, one of the things he said to me last Saturday night is this. He said, Glenn, the greatest gift that you can ever bring anyone is your spirit. Do you know what that means? It's like when you've been with someone, you either go encouraged, um, uh, elevated, built up, or you can leave them feeling disappointed, feeling sad. The greatest gift you can give is your spirit. And the Bible's very clear that God loves people who are cheerful in their giving because as you give of yourself, you leave a deposit in a person's life. And so the reason we tithe is because we're honouring God. The first speaks of our priority. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 9, 12, this service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. The second thing about the tithe is this, is that the tithe, our 10%, it tests what or who we trust. Remember, tithe is 10. Tithe is a 10th. And when we read our Bible, the number 10 is the number of testing. We think about the plagues in Egypt where God was trying to get the, the children of Israel out of Egypt and Moses went to Pharaoh and there were 10 plagues. It was a test of perseverance 
for Moses and God's people. Do you remember the 10 commandments? It was a test of obedience. Do you remember the 10 spies who entered into the promised land? It was a test of faith. And the thing about a test is this, is that a test is not designed to catch you out, it's designed to set you up. And it's so important to know that because when you approach a test, not as something to catch you out, but something to set you up in to be successful, then you'll think about a test in a completely different way. I mean, I gotta be honest, in high school, I hated physics and chemistry and any test associated with it, I felt like the teachers were there to catch me out. But the reality is this, is that if my life in the future was to involve uh, chemistry and physics, then they were setting me up to be a success in that field. I was so proud of my son last year because uh, we taught him how to drive. And I think it was probably February, maybe March, that uh, I started to teach my son how to drive. First time in the car, we went to a local car park at a, at a fields nearby our house. And I said to my son, son, repeat this after me. I don't know how to drive. I don't know how to drive. My dad has been driving for many years. My dad has been driving for many years. My dad knows better than me, I know nothing. My dad knows better than me, I know nothing. This car is a deadly weapon. This car is a deadly weapon. I will treat it with respect. I will treat it with respect. And then in the parking lot, I taught him how to drive. Clutch, brake, um, accelerator, and uh, handbrake and things. And, 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 and I just literally drove around the car park a few times. It's about 11 o'clock at night. Showed him the few things. And then I said, okay, son, your turn. So he gets in. I said, you don't even need to change gear. First gear, son, from here to there. And he drove for 15 seconds and turned around slowly, came to a stop. I said, well done, son. And then all of a sudden, the blues and twos went on as the police pulled into the parking lot, pulled up next to my son who wound down the window. The officer saying, oi, oi, what's happening here then, lads? Now, to be fair, we both had hoods and caps on in a car park late at night in, in my Volkswagen Golf. And uh, so it probably looked dodgy. I said to the police officer, officer, I'm just teaching my son how to drive. And, and he, he said, oh, good on you, buddy. All the best, son. And off he drove. And I turned to Jade and I said, how is it? You've been driving a car for 30 seconds <laughs> and the police have pulled you up. I mean, we walked through him through the theory test and and the driving test. And, and I had him on find my friends during the driving test. And so I'm watching him. I'm meant to be in a meeting, but I'm watching him. I'm saying, oh, not that junction, not that junction, not that junction. It's still moving. Great, he's not dead. And I'm praying him all the way through. And then I had this beautiful FaceTime call with him afterwards. Dad, I passed. And he's throwing his hands in the air and, and I'm cheering him. It's a great picture. I would show you, but he he didn't have his shirt on, so uh, I, I'm not gonna show you that, that, that picture. I, it reminded me of when I did my driving license, my driving test here in Manchester as an 18 year old boy. And afterwards I did some advanced driving lessons and some tests. And one of the things they taught me in advanced driving is when you're on the motorway, don't just watch the car in front, look through the car in front, look two and three cars up the road. And I can tell you just that little test, that little observation, that learning point has saved me at least two times from being in potentially major car crashes for me personally, because a test set me up to know what to do and how to continue living a blessed life. And it is the same with God. God's tests are designed to develop in you perseverance, maturity, and strength of character. And what the tithe does is the tithe tests what we trust. Malachi chapter three, it says this, we read it, bring in your whole tithe, test me in this. This is a dual test, church. This is not just you testing God, or sorry, this is not just God testing you, this is you testing God. This is you saying, okay, God, I'm going to respond to this test 
and I'm gonna bring to you my tithe. And in doing that, every time I'm testing God, because God says, Glenn, if you do this, I will throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour down into your life so much blessing that you will not be able to handle it. That's how I know what tithe people look like. That's how I know who are tithers when I get to know people. I begin to look around their life because it's not just a blessing of finance in your life. It's a blessing around your life in all areas. I can see blessing. I can see blessing. I can see, they must be a tither. This is a dual test. God testing you and me testing God. Because church, we understand, don't we, that we live in a supernatural realm. And so the tithe makes no logical sense. It makes no reason sense, but we live in a spiritual and supernatural dimension. So if God says tithe, you better believe I'm gonna tithe. And you guys, you make a choice. But I'm here to tell you today as a spiritual coach, if you want guaranteed breakthrough in your life, test Him. And don't be like that person who came up to me once and said, oh, uh, I tried t- tithing once and it didn't work. Well, that's as dumb as saying, I went to the gym once and I don't have abs like Idris Alba. You know, you, it, it's a lifestyle, it, it's, a, it's a pattern, it's something that you do. And then at some point, floodgates open and blessing pours. You know something, I believe that this week I'm blessed, not because I tied this week, but because I tied years ago in a fallow season, in a difficult season. And, and, and even though it leaves my hands, it leaves my bank account, it never leaves my life because I'm testing God. And God says, Glenn, if you live this life, I'm gonna open up the floodgates of heaven in your life. Invariably on a Sunday, someone will come up to me and say, Pastor Glenn, will you pray for my finances? And I would have genuinely love to do that week in, week out. But my first question is always this, do you tithe? Because I want you to know, if you don't tithe, my prayer for you is nowhere near as powerful as God's promise. Bring your tithe and watch what I'll do in Jesus' mighty Name. This is good stuff, hey. Anybody getting their angry email ready yet? (laughs) The third thought is this. Third thought is this, and we're gonna come to this table in a moment because I want you to think about this table. One of the things that I love to do in life is I love to go out with friends. One of my favourite restaurants is just around the corner from here. It's called Dishu. I think Riza, she's in our church. She's maitre d' there and she's wonderful. I've got a magic little key ring for Dishu. It's got a, it's got a, a dice on it. And at the end of the meal, if you eat before six o'clock, They bring to your table a tray and a dice. One die. A dice or a die? It's one. A die. Dice is two, is it? Okay. And and if you roll the die, die, if you roll the die and you get a six, it's free. But it's only for VIPs. You've got to be a VIP. In other words, you've got to eat there a hundred times. I was there just before Sophie and I went on sabbatical in June with Mark and Em, and um, I, I love hanging out with friends at a meal. It's good. You get to talk about so many different things, don't you? You get to talk about life. You know, I, I get to counsel Mark in his marriage. Whew, that was a long one. And um, it's brilliant just hanging out with friends. I, I love this. I love this. I think my favourite part of the meal, actually, food-wise, is the coffee at the end. I've got to be honest. Yeah, nice pate for starters. Meat for main course. Nothing else, just meat, that'll do. You know, cheese and crackers for dessert. And uh, the coffee at the end. I'm happy to tell you that on this particular day in June, Mark over there rolled a six and we had the meal for free. It was amazing. It's the first piece of good luck he's really ever had. For a long time. But just, I want you to think about this table for a second as we as we come to land. See, the third thing about our tithe is this, is that our tithe is an expectation of what is to come. 
It's an expectation of what is to come because the tithe is not just any 10%, it's the first 10%. It's the first 10% that everything that comes into our house that we then bring to God. Romans chapter 11, 16 puts, says this, it says, if part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, then so are the branches. It, it's the sense where you wake up in the morning and you make your bed. And the reason you make your bed is it really sets you up for success for the rest of the day. Jaden, that's why you should make your bed. And it's the same with the tie, that, that it's not, it's not I'm, I'm giving God the dregs, I, I'm, I'm giving Him my best. This is the story we have of Cain and Abel, the, the first two sons in, in Genesis chapter four. Read about it. Do, learn the principles of reading the Bible tonight and, and apply it to Genesis chapter four. The Bible says that they brought offerings to God and the Bible says God was pleased with what Abel brought because Abel brought a first fruit. The first of what he received. The Bible says in Genesis and way before the 10 Commandments, the law was given, that the Bible says that the man of God committed to giving God a tenth, giving it to the high priest Melchizedek. I give it to God, I'm bringing my, my first. And so God blessed Abel. God was happy with the sacrifice because it was the first tenth, first fruit. But God was not happy with Cain's offering because it puts it this way in Genesis 4, that in the course of time, Abel brought something. And it's the difference in giving between giving God our first and best versus our last and leftover. Oh, my tithe is not my last and leftover. It's not me giving to God what I have at the end of the month, it's bringing God first and saying, God, I'm testing you now with my first 10%. And I continue to do this as a lifestyle because you guarantee that if I do this, you're gonna bless. And it's way more than a financial blessing. It's blessing with your children. It's blessing in marriage. It's blessing in work. It's blessing in career. It's blessing. It's, it's almost like count your blessings, name them one by one. Let's begin to talk about what God has done. You, you don't even know where to start and where to finish because you look around, are there challenges? Of course there's challenges, but it's a life of blessing because I trusted God. So my tithe is the first and best. And I know I've done this analogy on stage a few times. You know, you take your kids to McDonald's and you have a coffee and, or a water and, and your kids have got the chicken nuggets and they've got their, got their chips and stuff like that. And then you sit there with them in McDonald's and you say, hey kids, can, at the beginning as they start, can I have a chip? You know what it's like. Oh, Dad. Really, Dad? Really? I mean, how dumb can the kids be and not breathe in the sense of realising everything they've got, everything they've got because I've given them. I just want one hot chip. Just one. And how many of you know, as a parent, it's much, it, it's, a, it's a blessing when your kids give you a hot chip at the start. Much better than they eat so much and get so full. Uh, yeah, Dad, you can have these cold, soggy, crazy, isn't it? Yeah, I wonder if maybe we do the same with the Lord. So I've got to get to Winslow, everybody, for church. But I love this. Look at this. Matthew chapter 10, verse 8. Freely you have received, freely give. Freely you have received, kids, in McDonald's, freely give. Freely you have received, freely give. In America, one of the main research agencies for the church globally, Barna Research, have just brought out some research just recently that say this, 42% of Christians in the US tithe, 43% of US Christians know what the term means and 57% have never been taught and don't really understand the power of the tithe. In their survey of tithers in the US, they discovered that tithers have less debt, have a higher net worth, they are reported to have reduced 
stress rates in life and higher life satisfaction. I reckon you can call that and He'll open the floodgates of heaven and pour down blessing. One last Bible verse, 2 Corinthians 9, 6 to 8. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. And so hey, listen, it's our choice today. It's either step into the test or not even walk into the room. But I want you to know that if you test God, God gives the guarantee that He will open the floodgates of heaven. And not just today, but I'm talking about a lifestyle of giving in Jesus' Name. Good morning. Good evening. Yeah. How was your meal? Meal was fantastic, thanks. I'm so full, I don't think I'm ever gonna eat again. Is there anything else that I can get for you tonight? I think we're done. Are we done? Foz, are you done? Foz is still eating, but he always leaves food. No, we're done. We're, we're good to go. Thanks so much. It's great food. Okay, what can I do? Uh, we just need the bill, thanks. Okay, no pay. problem. So the bill is £142.63. £142 quid. Foz, you glutton. How much did you eat? Amazing. Okay, 142 great. I'm paying. Yeah, I just, uh, before we do that, just need to decide how much you want to pay for a tip. Oh, I mean, it's customary 10%. I'm going to give 15%. Is that okay? Does Perfect. a tip go to you or does it go to the, the manager? It goes to the manager. Oh, I don't know if I want to I'll do take, that. I'll take cash though. <laughs> well, listen, the good news is this, is I haven't got cash with me, but Foz does. So Foz is going to tip you 15% and I'll pay the bill. Isn't it interesting, church? How with people we don't even know, we don't know if they washed their hands before they prepared the food. We don't know what's going on backstage in the kitchen. Isn't it interesting how at the end of a meal, we'll willingly give someone we don't know, don't trust, 10%. Bring your whole tithe and watch that I'll open the floodgates of heaven. No pressure, your choice in Jesus' Name. Amen. Thank you for listening to this Audacious podcast. For any more information, visit us online, audaciouschurch.com. We'd love for you to join us at one of our campuses, Manchester, Chester, or online every Sunday, 10 a.m. and 12 p.m. 